Excellent point. That's a good point. I might have to steal that one. Hey, glad you could join me. Seth Dunn over at the Pulpit and Pen website recently posted an article titled Resetting the Evangelical Mindset on Nabil Qureshi. Mr. Dunn is an MDiv student in apologetics at New Orleans Theological Seminary, where his emphasis is apparently how to poke the wrong hornet's nest. Normally, I don't respond to articles attacking Nabil. Anyone who deals with Islam on a regular basis is going to be attacked endlessly, so unless we want to spend all our time responding to attacks, we kind of have to ignore the attacks and focus on things that are more important. And we've understood this from the beginning. But I'm making an exception in this case for a few reasons. One, Pulpit and Pen is a fairly popular website. Why? I have no idea. It's a website dedicated to theology, polemics, and discernment. The discernment part is under investigation. Two, Seth Dunn is an aspiring apologist, and I think it's better to learn these lessons early on. Seth was even recently planning to run for president of the Southern Baptist Convention, so he has his eyes set on leadership positions. Hi, my name is Seth Dunn, and I'm to be nominated for the presidency of the Southern Baptist Convention. Here again, better to learn some lessons now rather than later. Three, Christians who target other Christians need to be careful, and as we'll see when we look at Seth's hit piece, he's the opposite of careful. Four, in his attacks against Nabil, Seth appeals to the work of Yahya Snow. Now, I respect legitimate Muslim apologists like Shabir Ali, and there are plenty of Muslims out there who are honest and sincere, but Yahya Snow isn't one of them. Years ago, we thought that Nadir Ahmed was the bottom of the Muslim apologist's barrel. Then Yahya Snow and his friends come along and make Nadir Ahmed look like Shabir Ali. The fact that Seth Dunn goes to Yahya Snow for his attacks against Christians shows that Seth has a serious problem with discernment. Five, Seth's criticisms of Nabil are really, really bad. And it's disturbing to see what the criteria are at pulpit and pen for challenging a person's integrity. So, Seth, this is an intervention. It's for your own good. And if it's any consolation, believe me when I say that this is going to hurt you a lot worse than it's going to hurt me. Let's begin. Within the past few years, Nabil Qureshi has taken the apologetic world by storm. His book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, became a New York Times bestseller. Qureshi claims to a former Muslim, I guess claims to be a former Muslim, and his book recounts the story of his conversion to Christianity. Then we have a description of Nabil from his website, continuing with Seth's comments. In Christian media and on the debate circuit, Qureshi presents himself as an Orthodox Christian. Notice that Nabil presents himself as an Orthodox Christian. His educational background is solid. Solid, you think? He got his bachelor's degree in communications. He completed a master's degree in Christian apologetics while he was still in medical school. He got his medical doctorate. Then he went on to a master's degree in religion from Duke University. He just completed his master's degree in Judaism and Christianity in the Greco-Roman world at Oxford University. And he's now working on his second doctorate. He's in the DPhil program in New Testament at Oxford. Pretty solid, but let's get to the inevitable however that follows the praises that supposedly show that Seth is being fair and balanced. However, recent events should cause discerning Christians to reconsider promoting Qureshi as an apologetic resources. I guess Nabil currently counts as more than one resource. They involve his participation in the ecumenical Reset 2016 event in Washington, D.C., and inconsistencies in his background story that have been brought to light by an Islamic apologist. So we know where this is going. Nabil spoke at a conference called Reset 2016, and there are inconsistencies in his background story. After we take a closer look at these problems, discerning Christians will have to reconsider Nabil as an apologetic resources. By the way, there's a reason I'm picking on Seth's writing, but you'll have to wait for it. Let's keep going. The Reset 2016 conference, set to take place in July 2016, features the typical Rouges gallery, I think he means rogues gallery, of cultural Christian speakers and artists, including Prosperity Pastrix Christine Kane, Hillsong United, Roman Catholic Matt Marr, writer of Spiritual Erotica and Voskamp, Revival Prophet Ronnie Floyd, and Circle Making Prayer Mark Batterson. Even the Pope of Rome is scheduled to speak. The purported purpose of gathering to enact cultural shift in American 
by calling on the name of Jesus. That's not coherent. Let's see. The purported purpose of gathering is to enact cultural shift in America by calling on the name of Jesus. Oh my goodness, this guy needs an editor. Oh my goodness, he is the editor. Pressing forward. One has to wonder if a gathering that includes enemies of the cross can do that. By throwing in with this lot, Qureshi raises suspicion about himself. Let's check out Reset 2016, also called Together 2016. So the goal was to gather a million people on the mall in Washington, D.C. for a concert and to listen to various speakers. I don't know how many people actually showed up. It was something like 96 degrees with the heat index, but that was the goal. On the list of scheduled performers and speakers were several people and groups I hadn't really heard of. The people I've heard of were Hillsong United, Lecrae, Francis Chan, Ravi Zacharias, Passion, Kirk Franklin, Casting Crowns, Josh McDowell, Nabil Qureshi, Michael W. Smith. Tim Tebow was also there. Here's Tebow with Nabil. I don't know who spoke and who didn't because the event ended early due to the heat. Pulpit and Penn took this as a sign from God. Bud Alheim, one of the other writers, declared the event was scheduled to run from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. God, however, had other plans. He apparently had enough of those prancing across the dais of deception and brought an early end to the apostasy. So the objection is that an Orthodox Christian apologist wouldn't speak at an event like this, given the views of some of the other people speaking and performing at the event. I guess we already know Seth Dunn's thoughts on Josh McDowell, Ravi Zacharias, and Tim Tebow. Heretics across the board. But Alheim, the other writer, says that all the speakers, including Nabil, are apostates. So how did Nabil get involved in an event like Reset 2016? Nabil can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking something like this. Event coordinator. Hey, Nabil, we're going to get a million people on the National Mall. Will you share your testimony or preach the gospel to them? Nabil. What? I'd love to share my testimony or preach the gospel to a million people. Sign me up. Event coordinator. Great, you're on our website as one of our confirmed speakers. Seth Dunn. Hey, I see that Nabil Qureshi is speaking at Reset 2016. I don't approve of the speakers. Let me see what kind of dirt I can dig up on Nabil to teach him a lesson. Namely, that no one preaches the gospel to a million people without me vetting all the speakers and performers. Seth, unless you have a very, very clear command from Scripture saying something along the lines of don't share your testimony with or preach the gospel to a million people if you disagree with some of the other speakers or performers, our standing orders are to preach. And here again, Nabil can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that if you offer Nabil a chance to preach to a million people, it won't matter much whether he agrees with every speaker and performer on every issue or he disagrees with every speaker and performer on every issue issue. If atheists contact Nabil and say, we'd like you to speak at our ironically titled reason rally where we sit around all day whining about a God we say we don't believe in while claiming to be free of all the religion we're clearly obsessed with, I'm pretty sure Nabil would accept the invitation. If Muslims offered Nabil a chance to speak during the annual Hajj, I'm pretty sure he'd be there. Following your reasoning, he shouldn't go because of all the enemies of the cross, as you put it. It's a pretty odd condemnation of a Christian to say, you're too willing to preach the gospel, I need to destroy your ministry now. If you look around at the world and the biggest problem you see is a guy willing to share the gospel in the presence of a bunch of people you don't like, I think you need to take another look at the world. But let's see what kind of dirt Seth was able to dig up on Nabil in his effort to shame Nabil into spending less time preaching the gospel. There is also suspicion about Qureshi's conversion story. Like many popular Muslim conversion stories, Qureshi's involves a dream or vision. However, in recounting his vision to different media outlets, Qureshi has given slightly different accounts of it. The following video was assimilated, assimilated like the Borg, by Muslim apologist Yahya Snow. Interesting that Seth promotes a video by Yahya Snow. Wasn't it Seth who just said that God's not going to bless your work if you associate with enemies of the cross? All Yahya Snow does all day is cyberstalk Christians and their families. He goes after our wives. He's so creepy he won't even show his face. And this is where pulpit and pen goes for information about Christian speakers? 
Yahya's ridiculous video is three and a half minutes long, but there's only one so-called inconsistency in the video. Yahya just keeps going back and forth between Nabil saying two things. Nabil is discussing one of the dreams he had before converting to Christianity. And in one interview, he says that in the dream, I was sitting at a table on the other side of a doorway. At the other end of a door is David, my friend, sitting at a table. In another interview, he says that I was standing on the other side of the doorway. And I wanted to be in that room, but I couldn't because there was someone standing at the door, my friend David, who had shared the gospel with me. And he was blocking the entryway. So in one version of Nabil's testimony, I was sitting, but in another version, I was standing. The obvious conclusion to draw, according to the dynamic duo of Yahya Snow and Seth Dunn, is that Nabil is being deceptive. This calls into question his conversion testimony, so Christians need to stop promoting Nabil as a speaker. But there's a problem here. I was there. I was there in the dream, of course, but I don't think being in someone's dream counts. I mean that I was there when Nabil called me after his dream and told me that he dreamed about being outside a door and seeing me inside at a feast. This was before Nabil became a Christian. I told him to turn to Luke 13 to read about what he just dreamed. What he told me on the phone was exactly what he wrote in the book. So unless Seth wants to say that Nabil was already plotting to invent a fake testimony back then, or unless he wants to accuse me of lying to back up Nabil, that story's not in question. I'm sure Seth is thinking, aha, but which story? We don't know because there are two, but we do know. There's zero confusion here because Nabil used to keep this cute little dream journal where he would write down his dreams like an adolescent girl. According to Nabil's dream journal, I was sitting at the feast. According to Nabil when he called me, I was sitting at the feast. According to the testimony he posted at Answering Islam after he became a Christian, I was sitting at the feast. According to his book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, I was sitting at the feast. According to the two dozen or so times I've listened to his testimony, I was sitting at the feast. But according to one televised interview, I was standing. How would saying one incorrect word in one televised interview after sharing the correct version over and over again in spoken and in written forms call into question a background story that's been thoroughly consistent for a very long time? And this is why I pointed out that Seth needs an editor. Seth types words, but they're not always the correct words. I don't know how much speaking Seth does, but it's much, much easier to get your words exactly the way you want them when you're writing than when you're speaking, and Seth can't even get his written words right. Why then would he apply a standard to Nabil that he wouldn't dream of applying to himself? Nabil actually messes up pretty regularly when he's speaking. Once he was talking about his life as a Muslim, and he said that he was always careful to step into the bathroom with his right foot first. Now, all I had known about Nabil's bathroom habits before this was that he always peed sitting down, like a girl. This is how Muslim men are supposed to pee, because Muhammad peed sitting down, like a girl. But I knew that Muslims are supposed to step into the bathroom with the left foot first, so after Nabil spoke, I asked him, what were you saying about going into the bathroom? He said, yeah, you're supposed to step in with the left foot first. So I pointed out, you said right. And he said, I did? This is actually very common among speakers. For example, here's William Lane Craig, one of the best speakers in the world, claiming that two plus two equals five. He says, but two plus two uh, does not necessarily equal five. Two plus two equals five follows from the axioms of piano arithmetic, which are necessary truths. Was Craig trying to deceive people into believing that two plus two is five? Or is it perfectly normal for speakers to occasionally mess up because sometimes they're thinking ahead while their mouths are on autopilot? If you condemn Nabil for something you could use to condemn any speaker, you probably need some better criteria. Moving on. Of course, a Muslim apologist is profoundly interested in refuting Christianity and its apologists. Still, readers should recall that it was originally a Muslim apologist who exposed inconsistencies in Ergen Kainer's Islamic background story. Bringing up Kainer actually backfires here. Muslims went through Kainer's backstory and found him saying all kinds of things that were factually false. Kainer claimed that he was raised in a Muslim country and that he was part of some 
youth jihad program and that he came to the U.S. as part of an Islamic plot and that he spoke in broken English. Kainer told audiences that he debated numerous Muslims and that he had debated Shabir Ali in Nebraska. Turns out that Kainer was raised in the United States and had never even met Shabir Ali. These are the kinds of things you find when you examine the backstory of a Muslim convert who's embellishing his story. Now, Muslims have spent far more time going through Nabil's backstory than they ever spent going after Kainer, because Nabil is on the front lines. Kainer never was. Kainer convinced his audience that he was on the front lines, but he wasn't. And what have Muslims come up with after spending who knows how many hundreds of hours desperately searching through Nabil's videos? He said standing doesn't change the meaning of the story in any way, but that's the smoking gun we needed so that we can accuse Nabil of lying in our pathetic attempt to keep Muslims from listening to his arguments. This would be comical if it weren't so incredibly sad for grown men to spend their lives trying to attack someone's character because they can't deal with his arguments. Of course, it's even sadder for a Christian ministry to jump on board with them, but that's pulpit and pen. Moving on. While the inconsistencies, that's an exaggeration, there's one inconsistency, in the dream stories cited above are slight, they, should be it, are relevant given the vast evangelical fascination with stories of Muslim dreams and visions of Jesus. So the slight inconsistency isn't relevant because Nabil said it, it's relevant because many Christians are fascinated by dreams and visions. What in the name of common sense would a fascination with dreams and visions have to do with posting an absurd attempt to undermine Nabil's testimony. Think about this. Nabil, when he was a Muslim, prayed for God to give him dreams to guide him to the truth. Nabil then had multiple dreams. In one of his dreams, he was outside of a feast that he wanted to be at. He had never read Luke 13. And yet, in his dream, he was in the story in Luke 13. Seems like a clear answer to prayer. Why wouldn't Christians be interested in that? Why would a Christian instead want to attack the story, especially a Christian who writes for a website that suggests that the heat wave of 2016 was God's warning to the Christians at Together 2016? So according to the theology of pulpit and pen, God sends month-long heat waves to shut down 12-hour concerts, but doesn't give dreams to Muslims who are desperately looking for a sign. We continue. Furthermore, Qureshi's very Islamic credentials are in question. Qureshi is a former Ahmadi. According to Snow, the Ahmadi sect is not considered Muslim by Muslims in the same way Mormons are not considered Christians. Christian apologist and expert on Islam, James White, concurs. Before Seth corrected a mistake when someone pointed it out to him, this passage originally said, According to Snow, the Ahmadi sect is not considered Muslim by Muslims in the same way Mormons are not considered Mormons. Was Seth trying to convince his readers that Mormons are not Mormons? Should this call his entire ministry into question? It should if Nabil's testimony is in question because he said standing instead of sitting. But on to a more pressing matter. Was Nabil Qureshi a Muslim? Nabil was raised as an Ahmadi, so there are basically three questions here. One, what are the beliefs and practices that qualify someone as a Muslim? Two, what did Nabil believe and practice? And three, do Ahmadi beliefs and practices rule one out as a Muslim? Let's go through these. Depending on which Quran verse or Hadith passage we go to, we can get all kinds of answers to the question, what are the beliefs and practices that qualify someone as a Muslim? Let's look at a few. Sahih Muslim 136. The Messenger of Allah said, whoever dies knowing and acknowledging that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, he will enter paradise. So according to Muhammad, if you sincerely believe that there is no God but Allah and you worship only Allah, you're going to paradise. Do Ahmadis believe that there is no God but Allah? Yes. So they're Muslims according to what Muhammad says here. But that's not all Muhammad says. In Sahih Muslim 93, Muhammad is asked what Islam is. He replies, Islam means to bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to establish the Salat, to pay the Zakat, to fast the month of Ramadan, and to perform pilgrimage to the house, the Kaaba, if you have the means. So you're a Muslim if you practice the five pillars of Islam. Do Ahmadis recite the Shahada and say their daily prayers and so on? 
Yes, so they'd be Muslims according to what Muhammad says here. But Muhammad continues because the man asks Muhammad about faith. Muhammad explains true Islamic faith as follows. It is to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, the last day, and to believe in Al-Qadr, the divine will and decree, both the good and bad of it. Do Ahmadis believe in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day and predestination? Yes, so they're Muslims according to this definition. But we have more definitions. For instance, in Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, Allah declares, but no, by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, O Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. Here we find that someone is only a Muslim if he makes Muhammad judge in all disputes, finds in himself no resistance against any of Muhammad's decisions and accepts all of Muhammad's decisions with full submission. So now you're not just required to believe in Allah, or to practice the five pillars, you're commanded to submit to everything Muhammad says. Given this definition, if Ahmadis reject something Muhammad said, we can show that they're not true Muslims according to Surah 4 verse 65 of the Quran. I should point out, of course, that I've never met a Muslim who doesn't have some resistance against Muhammad's teachings. If Surah 4 verse 65 is the standard, there must not be very many Muslims in the world. So those are a few definitions of a Muslim. The next question is, what did Nabil in particular believe and practice? I met Nabil in 2001. I learned that his name was Nabil Qureshi, so he had a Muslim name, but this doesn't mean much in college. I needed to learn more about him. We ended up sharing a hotel room on a school trip. As we were settling in, I started reading my Bible. I was doing the Bible in a year readings. While I was reading, I noticed Nabil pulling a prayer rug out of his suitcase, so he was at least concerned about prayer. He wasn't completely secular. I started praying, God, if you want me to talk to this guy, let him start it so people don't accuse me of being a bigot. Shortly after that, Nabil said, so, are you a hardcore Christian? And that weekend, we did a lot of arguing. Nabil told me that science and history and reason and logic conclusively proved that the Quran is the word of God and that Muhammad was a prophet of God. And he told me that the doctrine of the Trinity is nonsensical, that it would be immoral and unjust for God to punish Jesus for the sins of others, that Jesus never died on the cross, and that the New Testament can't be trusted in its present form. One of the main reasons Nabil and I became friends was that we were on the speech and debate team, and at night our teammates would go clubbing and drinking and occasionally smoking a little wacky tobacco, and we weren't interested. So we'd always be stuck in the hotel together where we would inevitably start arguing. Over the next few years, we did plays together. We did several public raps together. I would beatbox, Nabil would rap. I'd hang out at his house, his mom would make us delicious food, and we would end up arguing about the deity of Christ and Jesus' death and so on. Nabil was habitually 15 minutes late, didn't matter what was going on or how important it was, he would be late. The first time I ever saw him show up on time for anything was when he was breaking his Ramadan fast at sunset. He told me the exact minute the sun was going down so we could meet for dinner. And he was there, on time, for the first time ever but he was fasting for Ramadan. Eventually, we began studying Muhammad. Nabil gave a presentation over at Mike Lacona's house on Muhammad's amazing scientific insights that couldn't be verified until centuries after his death. Scientific insights that prove he was a prophet of God. I like staying on offense, so I bought a copy of Ibn Ishaq's Surat Rasulullah, our earliest detailed biographical source on the life of Muhammad. When I went to Nabil with a bunch of passages from Ibn Ishaq, he said to me, if you want to tell me something about Muhammad, it needs to come from the Quran or from Sahih al-Bukhari or from Sahih Muslim. What are those? Those are Sunni Islam's most trusted sources. So Nabil said exactly what just about any Sunni Muslim would say. He didn't demand that I defend my points by quoting Mirza Ghulam Ahmed in Ahmadi writings. He demanded that I defend my points by quoting Muhammad in Orthodox Sunni writings. Islam, for Nabil, stood or fell with the Quran and Muhammad. So I bought Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, 
and started bringing to Beale some very interesting passages about Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old girl and Muhammad allowing his followers to rape their female captives and Muhammad claiming to be a victim of black magic. We were still a long way from Nabil converting, but after he converted and his parents found out, his dad began taking him to various scholars to try to convert him back to Islam. Nabil wanted to be able to carefully explain his reasons for rejecting Islam, so we put together a massive written case against Muhammad based on what we had learned about Muhammad. So that's Nabil's background that I've personally witnessed. I'll just say here that it's very, very strange to me to hear someone say that this young man who spent years trying to convince me that God isn't a trinity, that the worst possible sin is shirk, that Jesus isn't God, that Jesus never died on the cross, that Jesus didn't die for sins, that the Quran is the perfect word of God, that Muhammad was the greatest man who ever lived, a man proven to be a prophet by science, history, etc., it's very strange to me to hear that this guy wasn't a Muslim, even though he prayed the five daily prayers, fasted during Ramadan, and was far more dedicated to defending Muhammad and the Quran than any other Muslim I knew. So why are there so many videos claiming that Nabil wasn't a Muslim? This brings us to our third question. Do the beliefs and practices of Ahmadis rule them out as Muslims? What are the core practices of Muslims? The five pillars. Ahmadis practice all five pillars. Nabil never took the pilgrimage to Mecca, but his parents did. What are the core beliefs of Muslims? Six articles of faith. Ahmadis believe in all six articles of faith. So if they agree on all of the core beliefs and all of the core practices, what sense does it make to say that they aren't Muslims? The answer is that Ahmadis believe that Allah sent someone after Muhammad. His name was Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. He was born in the 1800s. Why is this a problem for Ahmadis? According to Surah 33, verse 40 of the Quran, Muhammad was the last of the prophets. So the standard criticism against Ahmadis is that they can't be Muslims because they believe in a prophet after Muhammad. But here's a news flash. All Muslims are required to believe in a prophet after Muhammad because they're required to believe in the second coming of Jesus. Jesus will eventually return, according to the Quran, Surah 43, verse 61, and according to Muhammad. Muslims have various ways of reconciling this with the claim that Muhammad is the final prophet. Well, Jesus isn't coming back as a prophet or a messenger with any sort of new revelation. He's just coming back as a Muslim. But Jesus is a prophet in Islam, and Jesus is coming again, according to Islam. So like it or not, Orthodox Islam teaches that a prophet is coming after Muhammad. How does this relate to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed? What do Ahmadis call Mirza Ghulam Ahmed? They call him the promised Messiah. They believe that he's the fulfillment of prophecies about the return of Jesus found in both the Quran and the Hadith. And they have an interesting defense of their interpretation. They point out that the Old Testament prophesies the second coming of Elijah, but the fulfillment of the prophecy wasn't the literal return of Elijah. The fulfillment was the ministry of John the Baptist, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah. If John the Baptist was the fulfillment of the prophecy about the return of Elijah, why can't Mirza Ghulam Ahmed be the fulfillment of prophecies about the return of Jesus? So the difference between Ahmadis and non-Ahmadi Muslims is eschatology, their view of end times. They have a different view of the second coming of Jesus. Ahmadis believe it already happened. Does having an incorrect view of end times prophecies mean that they're not Muslims? Again, if we go with Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran, anyone who doesn't mindlessly accept everything Muhammad says isn't a real Muslim. But if this is the standard, I don't know any real Muslims. So the question is, how can Muslims claim that Ahmadis aren't Muslims without ruling themselves out as Muslims? It seems that Muslims would have to claim that Ahmadis aren't real Muslims because they have to stretch their interpretations of certain prophecies. But here again, Muslims in general do this. In John 14, Jesus prophesies about the Comforter, and Muslims say, that's a prophecy about Muhammad. And we say, Jesus calls the Comforter the Spirit of Truth who proceeds from the Father. And they say, yeah, that's Muhammad. So we say, but Jesus says to his disciples, the Comforter abides with you and will be in you. How did Muhammad abide with Jesus' disciples? How was he in Jesus' disciples? And they say, well, it's because Muhammad's 
teachings were the same as Jesus' teachings, so Muhammad's teachings were in them, and so on. And Muslims do this over and over again with biblical prophecies. If Muslims in general get to creatively interpret prophecies made by Jesus and Moses, why can't Ahmadis get creative with prophecies made by Muhammad? If odd interpretations of prophecies show that you're not a true Muslim, once again, I don't know any true Muslims. Now, the comparison we often hear is that Ahmadis claiming to be Muslims is like Mormons claiming to be Christians. But that's just silly. Mormons and Christians disagree on basic doctrines and practices, the nature of God, the nature of Jesus, the core teachings of the gospel, and so on. Ahmadis believe in all of the core doctrines and practices of Islam. They have a different view of the fulfillment of end times prophecies. What you can say in response here is that since Ahmadis take Mirzagulam Ahmed's interpretations as authoritative, they sometimes interpret passages of the Quran differently. For instance, most Muslims believe that Jesus was never nailed to a cross. Ahmadis believe that Jesus was nailed to a cross, but that he survived crucifixion. So they have a different interpretation based on their confidence in Mirzagulam Ahmed. But if they agree with other Muslims on all of the core doctrines and practices and disagree on peripheral doctrines because they believe in the interpretations of Mirzagulam Ahmed, the comparison to Mormons just doesn't work. A better comparison would be to Seventh-day Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists agree with Orthodox Christians on doctrines like the Trinity, the nature of Christ, and so on. But they believe in the interpretations of Ellen G. White, born in the 1800s, like Mirzagul Ahmed, so they disagree with most Christians on certain issues. Now, if a Seventh-day Adventist converted to Islam and said, I was a Christian, but now I'm a Muslim, would this be a misrepresentation? I don't see how. The person would have gone from belief in a set of orthodox core Christian doctrines to belief in Islam. It might be worth pointing out that the person was from a particular sect with some non-standard views, but Nabil does point out that he was an Ahmadi. He says it in Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. He made a video explaining why Ahmadis are Muslims. This doesn't sound like a guy who's trying to mislead people about his background. So I think Nabil is presenting his background in just the right way. Most people aren't interested in the eschatological differences between Ahmadis and other Muslims, and they fortunately don't have to hear much about it when he speaks. For people who are interested in the view Muslims have of Ahmadis and their reasons for saying they're not true Muslims, Nabil says he was an Ahmadi, and he's posted his reasons for saying that Ahmadis are Muslims. So the information is there for anyone who wants it. Muslims are free to disagree with Nabil, just as there are Christians who disagree on the status of Ahmadis. But to pretend that he's misrepresenting himself, or to use this as an excuse for dismissing his arguments, is a textbook example of desperation. Well, that's Seth's case for why Christians need to dump Nabil. Summing up, he says, When considering the questionable associations of popular conference speakers and booksellers, especially in a political environment in which there is a great fear of Islam and the moral decline of America, Christian consumers should be very careful about whom they patronize and promote. Qureshi's associations and backstory are suspicious. Things get even more disturbing here at the end, because right after telling Christians that they need to stop promoting Nabil Qureshi because of his suspicious associations and backstory, Seth quotes a passage from 1 Corinthians 6, the do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God passage. If Seth is connecting this to the preceding paragraph, it sounds like he's saying that Nabil's not a Christian. Nabil falls into one of the categories of people who will not enter the kingdom of God. I can't think of anything on that list that would apply to Nabil. Maybe Seth is saying that Nabil is a swindler. If that's what Seth means, this is exceptionally low. But we already saw that another pulpit and pen writer said that Nabil and Ravi Zacharias and Josh McDowell and Tim Tebow are all apostates. But it's possible that Seth wants to connect the passage to the paragraph that follows. Not sure how charitable I want to be, given how Seth spends his time going after Christians, but he concludes, Christians should remember that every brother and sister converted from complete lostness and spiritual deadness. Rather than judge Christian speakers by their backstories, Christians should judge them by the ongoing demonstration of their faith. 
No one's dream or vision is more trustworthy than gospel presented in Holy Scripture. Notice what Seth says here. Don't judge a speaker by his backstory. Judge him by his ongoing demonstration of faith. But Nabil's ongoing demonstration of faith is built into his backstory. Nabil had the closest family I'd ever seen in my entire life, not just close with his parents and sisters. We're talking aunts, uncles, cousins. I had never seen a family that close. And he was willing to give it up to follow Jesus. Nabil was taught from the day he was born that the worst possible sin is shirk, associating partners with Allah, saying Jesus Christ is Lord. He was willing to reject what he'd been taught from the day he was born so that he could follow Jesus. This is a guy who enrolled in a master's program in Christian apologetics while he was still in medical school because he knew that Muslims would be challenging him and he wanted to be able to faithfully defend the gospel. This is a guy who went to jail with me in Dearborn, Michigan for preaching the gospel to a group of Muslim teenagers. We sang hymns in our cells and Nabil preached the gospel to the inmates in the other cells. He's dedicated his life to defending the New Testament and refuting Islam. He's one of the few people I can point to and say, that's someone who is willing to lay his life down for Jesus. Seth, I don't know what kind of people you've surrounded yourself with over the years, but somehow you've become convinced that your role in the body of Christ is to go after people like Nabil and to team up with Muslims like Yahya Snow, who see Nabil's growing impact and are desperate to stop him. What does that say about your level of discernment? It would be one thing to say, I don't agree with Nabil's decision to speak at certain events, so let me state my position and move on. But to say, I don't agree with Nabil's decision to speak at certain events, so he must be an apostate, and I need to try to destroy his ministry by promoting the attacks of Muslim apologists, is so utterly ridiculous, I find it baffling that there are Christians who pay any attention to you. My advice to you is this, drop out of your apologetics program and do something else with your life. A man whose discernment is as off the mark as yours is, shouldn't be working with an attack dog ministry like pulpit and pen, and you certainly shouldn't be seeking leadership positions anywhere. But discernment isn't something that changes overnight. It takes years to develop good discernment. So you need to step away for your own good and for the good of the body of Christ. If you choose to continue on your current path, there are plenty of people willing to help you. You might even want to target me now for defending an apostate enemy of the cross like Nabil, which must make me and anyone who associates with me an apostate enemy of the cross. And Muslims like Yahya Snow are lining up at their computers to send you videos and articles about me and about Nabil because you're the guy they've been waiting for, someone gullible enough to spread their absurd attacks among Christians. And if you decide that you're going to continue dedicating your life to attacking Christians like Nabil, by all means, attack me instead. One of my greatest achievements in apologetics has been that Muslims like Yahya have become so obsessed with me, they spend massive amounts of time watching my videos and making pathetic responses to my videos. And any time they spend attacking me is time they'll never be able to use to attack other Christians. Yahya wakes up every morning thinking to himself, what can I do about David Wood? I live inside Yahya's head rent free and I like it there. It's very spacious. Never occurred to me that I might have to take the same approach with pulpit and pen, but if you absolutely must spend your life attacking Christians, let me introduce myself. I'm a professional rodeo clown. I distract Muslims quite easily. Based on what I've seen so far, pulpit and pen is the Yahya Snow of Christian websites. So I'd be happy to distract you too. Come at me, bro. But if you'd like to know ahead of time what kind of damage your cute little articles are going to do to me, click on this video and watch how I effortlessly respond to people who want to brutally murder me. If jihadis don't phase me, is pulpit and pen going to bring me down? Of course, since you and the jihadis who threaten to slaughter me and Nabil have the same goal, namely destroying our ministries to keep us from sharing the gospel, you may even find some more Muslims to team up with. Good luck with that.